Uh, hi guys, I'm Connor. I'm the visual effects supervisor here. Uh, I'm going to show you our reel real quick. Uh, real quick. Um, <laughs> yeah, play on words there. And uh, it'll show you some of the shots we've worked on previously. And then after that, we'll jump into some of the shots and do a little bit more of a breakdown and uh, the fidelity and like the detail that we can put into some of these things. So uh, yeah, here you go. Um, so yeah, I mean, and some of that work you have, you've probably uh, seen before on HBO Max and Netflix and things like that. Uh, we actually have director Alex here who directed some of that stuff. Uh, yeah. And, shout out to uh, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Shout out to Alex. Um, <laughs> let me. I'm gonna open up now uh, a little bit behind the scenes of of that kind of stuff right here. I actually swap the screens. There we go. Um, so one uh, visual effects is one of those things that like encompasses such a large variety of different types of shots. So it would be hard to show you kind of like the entire scope of everything we can do. But I wanted to show you some of the shots that we worked on this year that uh, we, we can utilize in different ways to showcase uh, some of the practical uses of visual effects. Uh, this right here is a, a green screen shot. And oftentimes when we receive green screen shots, they kind of like look like this. Uh, where they may or may not have tracking markers in them and you know, that's just a green background on them. Um, but one thing that we try to do as a company is to make sure that the vision of the director kind of comes to life through what, whatever they're, they're looking to do. And in, in this indie kind of like low budget film, they didn't have much uh, money to spend on filming background plates or, or, or things like that. We did have like some stock footage, which is some very generic stock footage here. Um, and ultimately, we, we knew we wanted to have like this rooftop feel to this visual effects shot. In order for us to get that, it took a few different uh, steps. First, you know, just kind of like color grading that down rather than, you know, having what we originally had. And moving into trying to make it look uh, more real through video. Because on the playback, I'll just show that real quick. Um, we added kind of these incandescent lights, you know, that kind of like flicker in the background, how real lights flicker in, in you know, real life. And trying to capture that on the footage, we were able to do that through several different means of using grain and lighting uh, transforms. Um, but one of the really nice things about compositing and visual effects is the ability to have that control over uh, different aspects of the lighting. For instance, they shot this very flat and we were able to bring down the edges of her using some normal maps uh, and creating some different shapes that way. Uh, for instance, you can see here, we actually created some shapes of around her head and her shoulders to be able to change the, the color grading there. And the fun thing about this is that we can actually go in and adjust these. So if we wanted to add more of like a you know, maybe a, a Funko feel to the shop. Maybe there's like a light off in the distance on this side of the screen here. We can always adjust those things directly inside of the comp. And when we're working on these kinds of shots, I'm always talking directly with the colorist. Keith here, you guys met, uh, met him already. Um, he is very much a part of the process of developing the looks of every single green screen shot that we do and every single visual effect shot in general that we do because color plays such a big, important part of every VFX shot. 
One of the powerful things about the software that we use here, Nuke, is that it allows us to have a perfect color um, from the very beginning all the way to the very end of the shot. And that's something that can be seen later inside of the DI. Because Keith can be grading this shot here and then be very confident that what he's grading on the image here is gonna be what he's gonna receive on the other side of the pipeline. And we can do that through you know, all of this. Um, the other great thing about Nuke is that we're able to feed him all of these mats so that way he can adjust everything you know, directly inside of the DI instead of us trying to do all of the color mapping because he might have a very creative flair that he wants to do in his shots that later we can adjust for um, through that. Another example of green screen uh, is this shot over here. And this was inside the reel as well. Uh, let's load that up. Um, this was a, a green screen shot that's you know on a train, and we got to do some fun things on this. Uh, primarily in the areas of the table down here, we were able to add in some reflections and some lighting that's uh, hitting our actors on the foreground. Um, and of course, when we receive that, it just looks like this, uh, very dark, and there's no uh, reflections on the table or um, any of those lighting effects. And we can add all of those using some different uh, compositing techniques to do that. What's great about this workflow, though, is that we're using the actual background as our luma source for what is being placed on the table. And so it does give us that kind of like realistic reflections that are hitting the table here. And we can always adjust those inside of our comp to you know, the liking of the director. Um, by making them, you know, maybe some different colors if we wanted to try to have more of an interesting, like, kind of uh, flair to it. But that's kind of the uh, the power of what we can do with the green screen here is uh, we do start the process by denoising it and then regraining it in the end. And using Nuke, we're able to use the actual BLGs. Uh, BLG is a base light grade that Keith uses inside of his actual grading system. And we can see what that's going to eventually look like. So if he has a grade on this particular shot and we want to send it to the client, we can actually load that grade if it's going to drastically change what this shot looks like and then be able to give that as a temp file to the director for review. Um, another example of some practical uses of VFX would be uh, some of these cell phone screen replacements that we did. Um, this particular shot, I just wanted to show two different types of screen replacements. This particular shot started as a green screen shot here, and it had some tracking markers on it. And you know, directors and producers always ask me, like, hey, when do you want tracking markers on there? When do you want green screen, blue screen, or just to be a you know a dark blank screen that you have uh, nothing on there? And that is always a tricky question because it kind of it's not a one size fits all for every scenario. In this particular case, we knew that there was going to be a lot of movement on the cell phone shots. So having tracking markers was very useful because we were able to go in and actually use that those different uh, spots to add some tracking markers on and then track the shot um, using uh, our, our uh, tracking inside the composite. Then later, we were able to actually place on our screen and. Um, this also gives us the ability, since it is like kind of a bit of a 3D track that we did here, that we can actually throw on anything we want later on. So if we wanted to add some, you know, I don't know, smudges, they have a very dirty phone here. Uh, you know, we can always dial that in to the liking here and then add some adjustments for that. We can even, you know, maybe even throw some kind of a grade on here to like make them, you know, um, I don't even know what that would be, but you know, uh, throwing some different adjustments on there to layer things on top of it, um, and that does give us the ability to you know kind of showcase that that way, and then also giving later mats directly to Keith so that way he can um, see everything that we're doing, and then even make some adjustments inside of his uh, DI. The <laughs> other example of not using green screen would be something like this shot here. Um, this was a shot that was done on a film that was shot on 35 millimeter film. And, um, you know, they, they had these beautiful reflections inside of the shot here uh, that we wouldn't have gotten if we had green screen. Because uh, the great thing about this workflow would be they shot it as a blank screen with all the reflections that we can use. And then we comp that back on top of the screen using all of these reflections inside of the finished shot. 
So uh, that looks like this here. Let's load that. And you can see how we can keep all of those reflections in there. That's really useful if you're trying to keep actors performances and be able to utilize um, an actor perhaps on the other side of the screen that's viewing the cell phone or viewing the TV or the computer monitor and you want to be able to capture those uh, reflections and be able to see that in your finished shot. Um, in this other shot that we did over here, uh, we didn't have reflections because of the green screen. Green screens don't capture reflections as well. Um, so in this particular case, we actually used a different shot from a different part of the film, which is right here, and then we just blurred it, reversed it, and then flopped it upside down, and then you get your reflections that we have. But it's in the same setup, in the same scene, so those lights existed in a different part of the shot. Um, other ways of doing that would be just capturing photos with like a DSLR camera or any kind of stills that we could use later for reflection sources. Um, and then in this particular shot over here, oh, we didn't have tracking markers on it, but the reason why that worked so well was because we actually did have so many sources of tracking that we could use around the screen and then use an actual 3D camera track. And once we had that, we were able to track the camera, find out what the Z space is of the camera and the lens type and all that, and be able to just drop in a card uh, essentially of what that screen would be and then place that in there and then you get your finished shot like this. So other than uh, screen replacements, uh, one of the other things uh, that I wanted to talk about briefly was uh, artificial intelligence um, and how you know it's kind of dominating our film industry right now. Um, but one of the use cases that we found with it was that we were able to use it for some de-aging on uh, this film here. We were able to make this actress uh, go from looking like uh, this to looking like this. Uh, so there was about a 20 year difference that they wanted inside of the film between her in some parts of the film and then now. And we were able to use some machine learning techniques to be able to accomplish that. So I could play this shot back real quick here. I need that now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, the, uh, I met the actress, and she was like, um, can you do that for me in real life? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'll make everyone wear glasses. <laughs> um, we have the time uh, given to it. There's a lot of process that goes into that, a lot of R&D. These technologies, it wasn't just a magic black box. I wanted to say that this was a lot of R&D. We used technology that was in beta, first of all. Second of all, it wasn't even designed for this purpose. And so we were developing it for this purpose and it took us about a year of time while they were uh, doing their edit. To what we knew we needed to do this to figure out exactly how we wanted to accomplish this. And it still took something down that would have been thousands of hours of CGI work to de-age you know, 20 minutes of the, of the, of the show, of the film, uh, down to about five, 600 hours of work. So it was a tremendous savings for, for them and still the same great result. And uh, the traditional use of uh, de-aging would be done through essentially a 3D model of the person's face being younger. And it would be modeled, textured, shaded, and lit um, as a younger person. And then they would put motion tracking dots on you know, an actor, a performance capturing master, uh, actor on set, and then they would then comp that CG face onto the shot. Um, in this particular case, they didn't have the budget or the time to do that. So we utilized several different features. Uh, Nuke just came out at this time with this feature, as Keith mentioned, it wasn't developed necessarily for de-aging or beauty work, but we ended up kind of using it in that particular area. It was actually developed as a auto-roto kind of like a method of being able to create roto mats from um, essentially just feeding it a photo and then creating a roto mat. Uh, what we were able to do was through a process of just few keyframes. We took three keyframes on this next shot I'm about to show you, and it's just three keyframes. And it's just, you know, her here, then here, and then here. And it's just the change in like the perspective of her face that we needed to uh, get the details on below her in her throat area, and then even the perspective on her nose. And we fed it both the stable diffusion version, which was the uh, cleaned up VFX AI done version of it and then the original image. And then through several different um, frames that we did here, we were able to teach the computer the difference between 
the clean input that we gave it as well as the painted version that we had already done. And that could be done through Photoshop, it could be done through any kind of process like that. And then um, on the output, the AI would then learn how to put those all together. And it would do it through thousands of iterations of taking that input, the ground truth is what it would call it, and then it would just do an AI output in the third column trying to learn how to essentially do that. And then in the finished product, you would then receive the finish shot, which looks like this. And that's the AI output that's painting over top of, you know, thousands of frames that didn't exist before because you can use this model on, you know, different shots and things like that. And you can go from just having three frames done to, you know, hundreds of frames at afterwards. And that just saves you, you know, many man, man hours of work. Um, we would feed it a mat essentially of only where the skin is. Um, you know, there's different methods of doing that, but we use DaVinci Resolves like a uh, magic mask essentially. And then uh, we would then take the AI model and then only do that specific area here. Let me load that real quick. And it would change her from looking like this to here where it's smoothing out the skin and kind of uh, doing her hand as well in her chest area. Uh, while also retaining all of the performance of her face, her eyes, you know, her talking. It's, nothing's reanimated, it's essentially just painted on top of. And, um, and that was how we utilized AI for this particular thing. Actually, there are, there's, a, I think, a few shots in this film where she's even crying and it does keep the tears with inside of it um, as well. But it was very important, this film, uh, I don't know if it was great in HDR or not, but it could have been because we retained all of the details and values of the shot and then didn't, it wasn't a, it was a very non-destructive process of doing the paintwork on top of it. And that allowed us to retain all of the details and make sure that we had the best uh, outcome possible. Yeah, everything we do is mastered typically in like 4K, um, a high dynamic range, Dolby Vision. So these are actually all EXR files <laughs> um, very big files and like that. And so, and um, it's you know, uh, it's more about better pixels than more pixels. And so, you have to make sure your pipeline and your color pipelines and everything like that never destroy any data or image information, so that you can preserve all of that to the very end. Never working in it's any display referred color spaces like Rec Seven or Nine. All of these are always working in a scene referred color space. It's a very technical thing, but it just ultimately means that we can deliver theatrically, which is what did, this film went theatrical, as well as uh, streaming home video and, and, and all the different platforms and things like that, so it can be available uh, and, uh, everywhere perfectly without, you know. And we, so and this is integration too between VFX and color, so we do, the, we do both. Yes, of course. And then, um, you know, here's just an example of when the client would ask for like a specific portions to be brightened up or lifted, we we're able to use our mats and our layers to essentially, you know, select specific parts of the image and like lift it and use um, in, in, in that use case. We're actually embedding most of these mats also so that Keith can, you know, do everything in the DI if necessary. Uh, ideally, we want in the comp to get as close as possible that it, everything kind of is in the same world and then Keith can then push it to wherever he needs to creatively inside of his timeline. Yeah, um, th none of these shots in here are graded. Yes. And all these shots are just, um, if there is any kind of show left, it's just temporary for the pre-visualization of, of it, So that, but it's not graded. So you're not seeing the final finished grades until you see what I would maybe do it in, in my presentation. Yeah. And then uh, the one last shot I wanted to show you guys. Uh, this was a film that I shot in January. Um, it had a, a bit of a monster effect, but I just wanted to show you some of the cool uh, things that you can do inside of your comp. Um, this entire shot is actually CG. Um, we were able to grab a 3D scan of the actual set location um, because the set only actually went to about here. And then we built up the walls on the set in order to build in some roof materials and whatnot. Um, and of course we added all the saliva, flames, and like everything like that. But this is sometimes what a comp could look like if you know you're trying to uh, maybe add in some more details of like uh, oh yeah that's right it's all down here uh, where you can change you know like what the eyes look like uh, oh that's right I'm not looking at this but um, this gives you a lot of um, 
you know, control over different aspects of the shot. I didn't really clean this up for presentation, but um, you know, the, the different colors of the saliva. We actually use different plates of saliva tracks, slime effects, and things like that that are coming off of the side of the mouth. Actually, I like the green eyes. I might keep it. Um, but yeah, so and I just wanted to show you guys real quick what something like this could look like, where maybe you're adding in some smoke and then some light that's going through the smoke, that's casting through the, the smoke effects. All of that's possible as well inside of a comp. Um, I often say that sometimes it's easier, if, especially if you're gonna be adding in, let's say, signage or something like that, it's easier to add in lens flares and smoke and kind of particle effects than it is to take them out later. So sometimes it's easier just to start with a clean plate. In this particular case, it would look like something like this, where it's just the background of the image, and then you're kind of cleaning it up to get your final uh, output of your image that looks like this. Uh, but yeah, so I can uh, answer any questions if anybody has any questions, but other than that,